Tom Burns work for Abstract Critical, and I just want to say thank you very much to everybody who's made it out on this particularly nasty, windy, wintry day. And a special thanks to Timothy Taylor Gallery for allowing us to have this event here this evening. Um, and particular thanks to Carla, who has uh, helped in the preparation of this evening. It's going to be a very interesting talk, I know. Um, we have three fantastic panellists, and I'm going to hand over immediately to Emma Dexter, who will introduce the two artists who are going to be talking about the show and about the work. Thank you. Um, I'm really going to act as a sort of interlocutor or, or referee between uh, the pair of you, because I really felt that for um, Jonathan Lasker, who is very much... Um, to use that terrible phrase, an artist's artist, that um, rather than hearing a curator pontificate about Jonathan's work, I thought it's really important to let um, two practitioners who are really working at the face of the canvas, if you like, and wrestling with all the things that Jonathan has wrestled with over the last 30 odd years, that it would be really good to get them to tell us how they engage with his work. Um, so, on my left, I'd like to introduce Dan Sturgis, who is um, a painter who lives and works in London. Um, he's currently, are you still directing painting at Campbell? Yeah, yes. Jolly good, <laughs> providing the next generation of artists. Um, he's currently in a group show at his gallery, um, Gallery Hollenbach in Stuttgart. And at the moment, he's in the news because he's curated an exhibition that's currently on at um, Tate's and Dives called The Indiscipline of Painting, International Abstraction from the 1960s to Now. Um, and I um, hope that we'll all get to go. How much longer is the exhibition on here? So it runs at Tate's and Dives until just after Christmas. Right. And then it in fact tours to the um, Mead Gallery, University of Warwick, more or less and stuff. Okay, so Mead Gallery is closer and cheaper to get to for most of us here. <laughs> 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 the only other place it goes to? Yes, just yeah. two names. Um, and on my right, I would like to introduce Stuart Cumberland, who also lives and works in London. Um, Stuart shows with the Approach Gallery here in London and with Noir Homme Gallery in Belgium, which he shares, in fact, with Jonathan Nasker. Um, and um, yes, I would like to hand over to you two. Before we do that, though, I would like to say that um, I hope either when you first came in or afterwards, you'll take some time to go and look at the work of Andrew Palmer, who is showing in our viewing room space. Um, a much younger artist, young London-based artist, who again, in a very different way, is working with the language of abstraction. Um, but if, we, if anyone wants to talk about Andrew's work, they can come up to me or um, to Andreas Leventis, who's here tonight as well, to ask any questions about that. So, um, I've, been, I've been nominated to go first. Jonathan. Which I nominated because I was slightly worried that we'd have the same notes, so I thought I'd get my go first. <laughs> and then, um, so, um, I've, uh, I'm, I was glad to be asked to do this, and um, the, first of all, I never turned down an offer to talk about an artist, but as an artist I became one because I didn't want to talk to people. So it always seems a slightly strange situation to end up um, talking about art, because to me painting is partly about going to a studio to be antisocial. Um, so then, uh, and then talking about Jonathan Lasker didn't seem like a particularly particularly easy option either. I don't think I've I don't think I've ever really talked about him in any length other than to say, which is, it seems to be the case, I find, just saying that's good, that's bad. And um, with Lasker, it often seems to be that's good. And, uh, and at the moment, or the last 10 years or so, I've been curious why he hasn't been um, so uh, prominent in an exhibition. So it's great to see this work here um, again in London. Um, I, uh, I do have loads of notes that I've written down, and. And I really desperately want to put my head down and read them out to you because uh, I can't remember most of what it says. Um, and, and it kind of struck, and, and I knew uh, when I was talking to my wife last night about what I was going to say that when she was falling asleep and I was reading it, that I had to 
make sure I was looking at everyone when I was talking to you. <laughs> and, it, and it kind of struck me today that the thing to do with... The, the, the thing of, uh, with Jonathan Lasker, and it kind of reminded me of this thing about reading, the classic thing about doing a talk and whether you read, which always seems to be awful, or whether you try and actually talk. Um, it seemed quite similar to the way Lasker works, and there's a the well-known method where he pre-plans the work uh, methodically beforehand, and then to a large degree he uses those plans to go through with the execution and the making of the work, which seems similar to me to this idea of writing something down and then, and then reading it. I, I, I hope you might share that with me as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, uh, I decided uh, that I should not read to you today, even though I will be doing that in part because I have some quotes and there are things that I really want to try and remember to, uh, uh, to say. So um, the, the, the main things that I wanted to talk about were the, the components that make up Alaska, and I think that they're, they're pretty consistent amongst all of the paintings he's been making since. Uh, more or less, there's, there's, there's two on the other side that are made just before he started using the maquette process. And then with uh, Blobscape over here, this is when he starts using the the, uh, the maquette process, so that the paintings are a bit more planned out beforehand and then executed. Um, and since then, the paintings more or less have these same three components that make them up. I think that's a, an important aspect of Alaska. The, the next thing that I found very important when I was thinking about the paintings over the last couple of weeks is that how apparent the chronology of the paintings is. That's, it's always visible how they were made, what, come, what came after them, each part of the process. Also, one of the things that I noticed that time is very visible in the work. Restraint, um, that is gesture made dispassionate, is very visible. Um, the planning, which I have down as an isolated activity. And then, this, this is the bit that I'm slightly suspicious is utter garbage, but it's the bit that I'm most excited about, and it's like, and I got to, when I was in here on Friday, and I was talking to Emma on Friday, and, and I was with a few of the pictures, and I kind of got a bit anxious, and I came up with this idea that the paintings are something like a heist, like a heist movie, and the artist is a safe, a guy who cracks into safes. So this is, this is, this is my idea that I'm kind of excited about, it's the, the main thing for me. It's actually all I can remember, so that's why I put the notes here. And the, um, the other part, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is invention, the invention that happens in Alaska painting, which I have down as something close to evolution, how forms evolve. So the, the first painting in the show is the one on the other side of this wall, and it's called Idiot Savant, and it's made in 1983, and Jonathan Lasker is 35 when he makes that. And the last painting, uh, chronologically, is this one over here, When Dreams Work, and uh, the artist is 44 when he makes that. So the, the exhibition uh, shows, w which I understand that Jonathan Lasker feels the same way, a very key period for him in the, in the formation of a, of a, a I, don't know, I hesitate to say formula, but a type of Lasker formula, which I think we recognise to a great, a great degree. The, the components I speak of that, that are three distinct parts, and this is not my interpretation, it's something that Lasker says, and that's the ground, which other than, there's three paintings that have a slightly dappled ground, other than that all the grounds are monochromatic. There's a line which tends to be a scribbly or a doodly type line, and often in black, and there's the figure which, I don't, know, I don't know if it translates differently in uh, New York and America, but in England, when we say figure, I tend to think of, of the human figure. Um, but it's a word that Lasker uses, and I've been... I thought that what it actually meant was something like example, or when you read a book and it says, refer to fig A, refer to fig B. So I kind of saw it as exhibit A and exhibit B. And the figure tends to be a, a thick area of paint, that's painted wet into wet. It's the, all the other parts are painted dry, uh, wet paint over dry, and that's the only part that's painted <coughs> wet into wet, and that's what would be called the figure. So there's the, the, the three components being the ground, line, and figure. Uh, the, the, so this show demonstrates that the ground, um, you have a ground like this, and, but most often 
the, the paintings develop into having a monochromatic ground. The line is more often than not a scribble, and the, the figure he has, th this painting would show that it's quite thin paint, but I think most of the paintings of, of since then have, have had very, very thick paint, noticeably so. Jonathan Lasker has, uh, I think, very obviously taken on board pointers from the, the main American art movements of the 20th century. Process art, conceptual art, can I remember the others? <laughs> pop, pop art and minimal art. Um, the, the chronology of their making is that, and, and I think everyone can see it, I don't know, as a painter, then I'm, I'm very aware, I'd imagine lots of you are very aware how long it would take oil paint to dry, and these, these are all oil paintings, as I don't think he ever used acrylic to my, to my knowledge. So the paintings, when you see them, like uh, the, the ground to this, but more often in something like the big picture over there, the ground to that, that's gonna, that's gonna he uses opaque paint, so it's solid. I don't know if he uses one coat, but the ground's gonna take a certain amount of time to make, and then it's going to make a certain, probably a week, I'd say, to dry. And, and then he, so you can see that he does that, and then he waits, and then he does the next part, which is the line, and then again he has to wait for that to dry. So I, it, even in the ground of the, the ground and the line, and already there's a two week period happening. And then suddenly when he goes into putting the figure down, fig one, exhibit A, the wet into wet part, then he puts it down, it's over dry ground, but then he immediately goes into that wet into wet, so you suddenly see this change of speed that happens. And that, I think that chronology is, is very visible, whether you're a painter, or no matter what you do, you can see that. I think it's, it's very there. And I, I think that that can be a, a pointer from uh, process art that he's, taken, he's picked up. And the... The, the way the paintings are made, I don't think it's a particularly skillful. They seem very accessible in terms of, I would imagine that most people feel that they could make these. And I've, I, was, I don't know if it's too much to say that it's a kind of, what he provides somebody with is almost a list of instructions in how to make this thing. And I could kind of liken that to some sort of Ikea flat pack. <laughs> so I, I think that there's always, it's always been evident in what he does that he might not make the marks. Maybe, maybe he would always, I mean, maybe he does, I don't, I don't actually know, but I'd imagine he always does the wet into wet bit, but whether he, he does the, all the dry bits, then I don't see why he would need to, and that, that seems very apparent. So, um, and I think this is something that's taken on by American artists most, especially is the idea of the artist as a post-industrial conceptual manager, somebody who, um, contracts out the work to a, to a cheaper workforce while they're having the, having the ideas and then they contract out the work. The, the um, what have I got here? Flat monochrome grounds and detached methodical construction nods to minimalism and pop. Okay, so the, the next thing that's very important is that the works look, they have a minimal look to them, but unlike the minimalists and, and kind of like the pop artists as well, Jonathan Lasker uses composition, and the minimalist artist very, very famously and aggressively avoided composition because of its European heritage. Jonathan Lasker, his paintings are all about composition. Composition is what they are. The, the paintings are never improvised, and we know that uh, Lasker played in a rock band when, I don't know how old he was, I don't, I don't, don't know what the overlaps are with that and being a, a painter, but he, painted, he, he played in a rock band as a uh, bass guitarist. And I was, I was thinking about the idea of, hit, of that tradition of being a singer-songwriter and then performing once you've written the song, and, and, and in a way that seems similar to this idea of the pre-planning. And the, ma the maquettes that um, he makes so that he can copy them for the paintings to some degree. In terms of the maquettes, I, I, I sort of wanted to not talk about them, and it, but it seemed an impossibility. And, and, I th and I thought that everyone, it must be apparent to everyone when they're looking at Alaska that he must pre-plan the, the paintings beforehand because there are, there are no so-called errors, there are no so-called mistakes, there are no alterations, which is the sort of thing that you'd see in a very typical 
uh, Picasso or Matisse paintings, you'd see that this was over here and then it was moved over here, whereas with Jonathan Lasker you can see that doesn't happen. That goes there, that goes there, that goes there. Um, Lasker didn't start making maquettes until 1985. He was in, I don't know if it's of any significance, but he was in Germany at the time and he had a studio in the countryside and this is when he started making maquettes in 1985. And um, this painting here, I think, must have been amongst the first to use that technique of, of the pre-planning beforehand. This one weirdly came after it and it looks like it's partly maquetted and partly um, invented on, on the surface because it seems to have quite a history of the surface underneath, whereas these, these don't so much. Um, when, I, when I imagine Jonathan Lasker's work, I don't really know much about how he works, I'll be honest, uh, but I imagine him to be, I know that he, he makes the maquettes in his living room and I kind of have this image of him in some sort of silk gown, um, <laughs> sat down, and the room's all dark and he's got a light overhead and he's sat at his table and he's got all of these... It's a, it's a nice scene, it's a nice scene, I think. He's, a, he's sat there, he's got um, bits of paper that he's prepared weeks before with oil, oil paint on them, nice, clean, flat colours. He's got um, oil paints, brushes, um, uh, ballpoint pens. The, the first time I came across the word was Kugelschreiber because it's the first Laska book I saw, which is a ballpoint pen in German. Uh, magic markers. And I just imagine him sat down... Um, trying to make the images from his notebooks into, into something far more concrete and really getting latched onto that and, I don't know, taking 12 hours over this process. But it's definitely something I saw as being um, an isolated one. But the, the, this is really what the public sees. And these paintings I then see, not somebody um, sat down like this, but somebody in a more public space, a studio, with assistance, with the paintings upright. Um, so I see those two things as very different, and I see one as to do with isolation and one to do with a more social situation, which is where the um, paintings end up in the gallery and in the world as a, in a you know, social context. So th this is the bit that kind of got me excited. Um, and, and it's when I suddenly thought that the, the paintings and the whole process is something like the planning of a heist. And you have this guy, it's, a, it's, it's one of those, I, don't, I, don't, I think there's a heist movie, which to me is when you go into a bank and you like stick up with your guns. It's a type of, a type of heist movie, but it's when, the, when you have the solitary criminal and they go in after dark, they've planned it all methodically. They go, they go out, they scope the joint, you know, they're really well dressed, they scope the whole thing. And then when they've got this plan, um, they go in one night, and they've got the whole thing laid out very clearly what they're going to do. And they go through this step-by-step -step procedure that they planned out beforehand. And it's so well planned that anything that happens, and something might happen, something always seems to happen in a, in a bit of crime, that he's, he's ready to deal with that. And I think that Lasker can deal with that as he goes through it. So I, I suddenly thought that these, these paintings are kind of like the safe breaker. And, and that the, um, the after-hours robbery is the one... I saw as most like it's the, 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 the painter that I imagine, this guy working when, when everybody else isn't working, maybe. And, and that's something that um, Philip Guston would be a, a very good example of. The reason I came up with this is that I was looking at this painting over here, Blobscape, and I was feeling kind of tense in this room. Uh, Maybe because I had to talk today, but I think the paintings made me feel tense. And I suddenly thought, this painting reminded me of Mission Impossible <laughs> with Tom Cruise. <laughs> and with Lasker, you don't, get, you don't get any drips, you don't get any mistakes. <laughs> he, he never drips, which is, which is interesting to me. And this painting, I thought, had a diagram of a mistake in it. But, <coughs> and that's that bit that's kind of escaped over there, this, this pink bit which he's definitely, you know, it's definitely intentional, but it's an idea of a mistake. And he's cancelled the mistake, kind of like wiping the sweat off your brow. He's cancelled the mistake by scoring it through with the, with the black line. And the, the painting over the, the back there, Elaborate Stasis, has a similar, you can see, just about see in the bottom right, has a similar thing, which I would liken to the, to the drip or the, to the mishap. And this, I've, I've likened to this, the idea, I don't know if, if you remember the film, we've seen the film, Mission Impossible, and Tom Cruise drops down into this room to crack into this safe. 
and he's, he's down there and it's very nervous because if he cracks a sweat, the alarm's going off because it's going to just drip onto the floor. And I suddenly realised that this, for me, this is why I'm tense when I say Alaska painter. <laughs> at that really, really tense moment, he goes through all of this process, but then should, should he crack a bit of sweat, the game's over, it's all over. And I suddenly, for me, that, that was a very important realisation. I mean, and I was kind of excited about it, but um, I didn't know whether it was just completely stupid. <laughs> um, I think I came up with it partly because images of the artist, he's always wearing a, a, a suit and a tie, and he always has this tiny little tie that's done up super tight around his neck. Um, so that I think that came to it. And also the fact that I do feel, I do feel slightly anxious in, with his work, and I think that, I think that, that was intentional. I, then on this safe thing, I then began to think, well, what's in the safe? And what's he stealing? What's he trying to get away with? And I kind of thought, well, that's all kind of exciting, you know, it's, not, it's kind of money, and like, art, art's a kind of a heist thing, and we kind of want the money, but I don't know, I didn't, I didn't think it was necessarily so straightforward as that. I was thinking, oh, I don't know what's in the safe, but it was exciting. Um, I, I kind of, the, the, the tension for me was this point where there's this guy doing this thing, or even in an interview, and, and he's trying to keep his poker face, and he can feel that moment when the sweat is just under the skin. You're trying to look cool, and you're trying to look relaxed, but the sweat's just there, and you're just holding it in place. And this, this is, for me, the, the image I have of the paintings. Well, I'll just conclude. I'll just stop, if that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Let me stop. I'll stop. You stop. <laughs> um, well, I'll start. Um, so, um, it was um, it was quite strange actually being um, uh, phoned up and um, uh, asked about um, speaking about Jonathan Lasker's paintings a few weeks ago because I had um, a few weeks previously got down from my bookshelf a little book of his collected writings which some of you might know which is called the Complete Essays and I think it was published in about 1998 because I wanted to re-remember a article which he'd written about de Kooning, because as you probably know, there's a big de Kooning exhibition on in New York, and people were talking about it. And the article about de Kooning, which I couldn't remember the title of, I just remembered it being absolutely an amazing title. And it was called Beauty in the Age of Roadkill, which I, I rediscovered. And the, the point about it was that... Um, that uh, Jonathan Lasker was writing about de Kooning's work and writing about sen sensation, the idea of sensation, and about um, de Kooning's women, the, the paintings of the women, the well-known paintings of the women, and saying that they were like roadkill, like a small animal on hot tarmac that's been hit by a car, and how you could see in the blood and the gore, you could just about see the outline of the figure of the little animal. And um, that kind of relationship um, to, um, to Kooning's paintings, I thought, was just uh, a, a, in a, an incredibly perceptive one, but also one which was very um, irreverent and very kind of, um, kind of interesting and exciting. Um, so it then seemed I'd been thinking about it before even realising this exhibition was happening, and it all sort of fitted into place. Um, so I first saw um, Jonathan Lasker's paintings in... Um, 1987 at the um, Saatchi Gallery in Boundary Road when there was that New York Art Now show, um, which was um, which I saw as a student, and it was um, it was uh, um, the whole exhibition was amazing, um, but I do remember very much um, when we're looking at the Lasker paintings how that they they belonged slightly in a different realm to some of that other work, which was much more about appropriation, about appropriating. Um, um, ideas, I suppose, and ideas within painting. And I, similarly to Stuart, felt then, and still feel now, re-seeing these early paintings, that sense of kind of, of sort of, um, well, anxiety is how Stuart referred to it, but it's sort of just like worry when looking at the paintings about, about what they're asking us to think about, this idea of abstract painting, or what abstract painting is, or what painting is or could be. And that's certainly something that I remember from the very first showings of, of, of the paintings. Um, and then, obviously, 
later, um, a little bit later, uh, they were shown in um, Adrian Searle's curated show Unbound at the Hayward Gallery, which some of you might have seen, um, where, again, that, I, that idea of sort of anxiety or uncertainty about what's, uh, what's allowed, as it were, within the remit of a, 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 of a painting. Um, and I suppose that kind of posing the question to the viewer that, um, that way that the paintings ask you to ask questions, not only about their making, but about the kind of references they're drawing on, um, about the legitimacy of the references they're drawing on, is something that I see as very important for a painting to do. Or I see as something which is you know, a very interesting place for a painting to be at. Um, I suppose the other thing to say, um, kind of early on, is sort of, um, which I think you see in this you see in this exhibition, is how the how the paintings um, are in a sense you, these are the, these are works which are from a transitional moment or from, uh, uh, of uh, in Lasker's career, um, and um, we uh, point out the first and the, you know the last paintings, and you can sort of see. How they the the, the 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 in the later works how this um, mature style of using the maquette and then sort of um, making an abstract painting which is of course not an abstract painting at all but it's a representational painting of a little maquette like a like a sculpture <coughs> might a sculptor might use a, um, a maquette to make a painting is kind of derived that and then in some of the earlier paintings like Blob Sphere here, or um, some of the ones around the corner, you have very, in a sense, figurative references in, and which are more evident perhaps in slightly earlier work, but you begin to see things that are actual representations, or I think as representations of things, like of a jug in this one, of wallpaper, perhaps in, in, in another. And it sort of reminds you that where that where Alaska was coming from at that moment in, in the 80s in New York was, a, in a sense, was a, was a painting in a, in a sense, was a painting tradition. That the people that he was um, taught by at CalArts, and notably um, um, sort of um, conceptual art school, um, but the people he kind of gravitated to, towards, I suppose, were artists who were just a little generation of older than him, like Susan Rothenberg, who was um, uh, associated with new image painting, which was the title of a, a show which probably you might know about, which was um, in about 1978 at the Whitney Gallery, which was of artists who were um, beginning to use sort of figurative references in paintings as a way of kind of getting out of minimalism, really. Um, Joe Zucker was another artist who is a complete favourite of mine, uh, um, who was also in that, um, in that exhibition. So, um, and then the other person that Lasker has talked about who was an influence when he was a student or when he was a young artist is um, Richard Ar Archwager, with a sort of proto, you know, sort of pop minimalist artist, which has a, um, who has a kind of a dumbness of presentation to it. And I think it's interesting looking at these paintings about how there is a sort of, you know, the, the, there are these figurative kind of relationships come within these abstract paintings. And another thing, um, uh, um, an, uh, another sort of point to sort of make is that, um, that in a way, I, um, as Lasker himself has said, he doesn't really regard these paintings as abstract paintings. He call, he's referred to them as abstract pictures or abstract picturing. Um, because it seems to bring in this idea of picturing coming from a different tradition and abstraction from a different tradition. They sort of come together um, and ask us to kind of question, um, uh, question those terms, really. Question what we assume or what we kind of belie believe in. Um, and many of, the, you know, often they're also described as, um, he describes them as being as like, like interiors or landscapes or portraits. And you sort of see that, particularly perhaps more with some of the earlier paintings, you can see how they seem to have an interior feel, or the use of sort of the wallpaper backgrounds give them an interior feel. Or with some of the later paintings, he's described bits being like heads or horizon lines or landscape arrangements. And that, in a sense, that's drawing from a very different tradition to those other 
um, appropriation artists like Halley and um, Philip Taff and people like that, who he was first perhaps associated with and first showed with. And I think it's that, diff that different place of tradition, that different place where the paintings emerge from, which makes them so kind of, you know, which makes them very wonderful, which makes them, uh, um, that th th they come from a, tr a particular tradition within a type of painting. Um, so another thing to say is that um, the same year um, that um, um, Adrian Stowe curated the Unbound exhibition at the Hayward, which these paintings, which some of these, well, which different um, Jonathan Lasky paintings were included in, but from the same period, there was a smaller exhibition which was curated um, at the Todd Gallery, which was a commercial gallery, um, which was called Chance, Choice and Irony, and um, which had um, Lasker paintings being shown alongside um, <coughs> the Fiona Ray paintings, David Reed, another American painter, some other artists I can't quite remember. Um, and in the um, catalogue of that, there is a series of interviews which Tony Godfrey um, um, talked to various of the artists about. And talking about um, Lasker's paintings, um, Lasker talked about um, the history of Mannerist painting and Genovese Mannerist painting, and particularly about Alessandro Magnesco. Um, who, um, there aren't actually examples of his paintings in the National Gallery, but there are in the Louvre. And he's a sort of later Mannerist painter where Lasker said one of the things he was interested in is how, you, how the, the, the um, within this, um, this sort of, um, uh, within these paintings, how the individual sort of brush marks, the individual elements of the painting have been sort of broken down, kind of disintegrated. And I think that sort of picks up a little bit on Stuart's point about this figure-ground relationship, about how there's been a sort of breakdown in things that could have once been very closely held together, about unifying figures and ground, how perhaps um, uh, they've been very much split. And also picking up on the point that Stuart made about the sort of rock music kind of um, relationship, um, Lasker is also in another of the artist's statements, which is in this little book, this very wonderful little book of his writings. He talks about figure ground line relationship being like a rock band, being like the drums, the guitar, the bass, and having that sort of play with, play with things. Um, okay, there's one, I suppose there's one last thing I want to say, which is about this idea of time, <coughs> which is something which has been picked up. Um, and it's to do with the time of making and the time of manufacture, because um, it is a sort of manufacturing process, the painting of the final painting. Um, and the way that a scribble or a doodle which has been done, um, or a, um, uh, a, 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 an element of drawing that's been made in, on, the, on this sketch, which might take perhaps, you know, um, a few minutes to make, then takes up my, when you see it sort of being painted on this huge scale, in oil paint, you realise it's taken a whole day, probably, to, 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 to fill, um, to, to cover the, 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 the sort of territory of it. And you have, um, and then you have the sort of, uh, the other element of the sort of the next part, the next layer of the painting, being kind of put on top, um, which again has a, another, a different speed, the sort of wet on wet speed of it. And all these different types of way that the speed, uh, the speed or time is captured within the making of the painting uh, is kind of really evident and is really there and is kind of something that you see when you're looking at them, that you, you sort of unpick that <coughs> making process. So they're very open to you know, they're open and generous works in the sense that they're, they, they reveal themselves, they, they reveal exactly how they've been made. You can't quite believe, perhaps, that they have been made like that, which gives them a sense of doubt, which I very much enjoy. But um, they, they, they wear their colours very clearly on their sleeve. Um, yeah, so I might just stop there. <laughs> um, thank you. <coughs> both of you, um, Stuart and Dan, for two very eloquent and, and perspicacious analyses of, of, of Jonathan Lasker's practice. Um, I mean, uh, 
it was very interesting what you said about, and I hadn't really thought about it before, but one of these tensions that you get from his work is the tension and sort of ambiguity between the knowing, ironic, um, as you say, sort of appropriationist field that he was both put into, but I think also wanted to fit around and be part of, because obviously it was, it was the coming thing, it was the, the new face of the art world at that time, and yet at the same time how to also be part of sort of new image and things like that. So just, again, when you put those two things together in your head, yes. um, it's quite a clash, it's quite uncomfortable um, to even think about them in the same sort of visual field. And yet it's interesting then when you look at a painting like that, for example, um, you can see how Jonathan Lasker has managed to achieve a strange fusion of those um, different impulses that were happening in the painting in the 1980s. Um, and um, just also to go back to some of the things that you were saying, Stuart, um, these kind of list of instructions, I mean, you're, it's very interesting hearing you both talk because you're talking very much with the language of makers and practitioners and knowing how the paint goes on and how long it takes to dry. And I think for me, as a, as a slightly more um, ordinary viewer, I'm not so aware of that. But I suppose the things that come over to me are more things perhaps to do with language and, and vocabulary and, um, like you say, sets of instructions and how um, it's a puzzle, really. You feel as if you were literally... He's, he's found a visual language that, is, that says, I am a puzzle, basically. And you then, as a viewer, go around trying to <coughs> decode this particular puzzle. And, um, I mean, for me, it's the puzzle... Of, it speaks about the puzzle of what it is to be a painter or what it is to be an artist, because... It somehow makes manifest that awful feeling of what am I going to do on this canvas? You know, how do I fill this tabula rasa? And so there are, so somehow, I mean, I'm sure I'm just I'm projecting this, but so the scribbles, the anxiety to cover that amazingly large canvas in its entirety, and the, the sense of this weird combination of of abandon and then control mm -hmm. at the same time, um, again, I think also leads to the sort of sense of anxiety that both of you have pinpointed. Um, well, I thought, I remember the first time I saw Alaska and I was, um, I, mean, I suppose in a way I was embarrassed about it, in a way when I see it, it's really good, I'm embarrassed because I think, bloody hell, it's easy. You know, you see it, you think, God, it's that easy and you've been jerking around all this time and, and you haven't come up with much and then you see you see this and you think well god this is, this is really easy it's just like well I didn't I, in a way I didn't know what the formula was then and I kind of know what the formula is now um, not not that you can copy them once you know the formula but I, I was I was really quite stunned that you could do something so straightforward um, and and have so much attitude in it without actually too much posturing by the artist behind it, you know, there's no stories about him going out and, you know, rock and roll stories. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just these very straight up punchy paintings that you look at and you go, you see that immediately you think, God, I could make that. Immediately, which is a wonderful thing and often what modern art's criticised for is my five-year-old could do that. And, and you, you would see these if you saw them in a book and you go, my five-year-old could do that. And of course your five-year-old couldn't do this because we're, the, the things we're talking about, patience and time and restraint are, are all there. And so they're actually, they're actually become incredibly complicated things, but then they, I mean, there's that tension in how, how upfront, straight, simple, dumb they are. It's just, and, and it is, it's kind of easy to forget how, sh to me, that was always shocking. And it's easy to forget that in a way. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that's been interesting to me, it's always been interesting, actually, is why Jonathan Lasker hasn't been more popular um, in this country, maybe, because that's where I see it from. And he's just gone out and, you know, I've never been into Gerhard Richter, I'll get it out, I'll say it. I've never been into it. 
never ever been into it. I'm sorry. And there's a show on him every year at the Tate. We don't need to see him every year at the Tate. We just don't. I mean, okay, okay, I'll, I'll grant he's brilliant. I'll grant it. But every year at the Tate, and there's all these other people making work that I think are offering really interesting um, takes on what can be a painting. Really, you know, I, I, there's no no one can convince me that this work isn't. Um, more important, at, at least as important as, as a Gerhard Richter. And, it, and I was thinking that one of the things that's really happened, I think, in the last 20 years is that um, painting has been, and this isn't like, I don't, I don't have any friends or I like this, I won't even talk to the people, but painting is, uh, I'm dramatising, painting has been more focused on the photograph, which I think was why we have, um, you know, Richter and a whole host of other people that I don't want to give credit to. <laughs> and, and I think the people like Lasker who make amazing images, not based on the photograph, which I think is a really fascinating pursuit for a painting to take, have, in a way, I, th I think they've been neglected. I'm not very happy about it. <laughs> Do you think Lasker could be anything other than American? Could he be a European artist? Well, it's, it's interesting that the, he made his first maquettes when he was in Germany, and I think he even he got his most support maybe early on in his career. I don't know, but I got the feeling that he got most support in Germany. I, I seem to recall that Christopher Wall equally has said the same thing, that he got the most support in Germany earlier on. Um, somebody asked that at the Gerhard Richter talk. Um, could he be? Could he be from New York? And, the, and Benjamin Brooklyn said no, so I'm saying no. <laughs> I mean, there, there seems to be something, uh, this neurotic quality, that Woody Allen has, that seems very New York. And, uh, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not seeing the word neurotic written about Alaska, but uh, they, to me, they seem utterly neurotic, <laughs> totally and utterly. I, I see them. I mean, I, I think I think you do place them, and you do see them within a kind of American context of American painting. I mean, uh, and I think um, that that um, yeah, they are sort of culturally specific in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I definitely there's definitely process art. There's definitely pop. You know, these things, concept art in a very American way. Yeah, definitely. Well, do, do, you, do you think they kind of hardly feel that um, obviously they could just be like a backdrop for like an American psycho, you know, dancing around his room, they'd be in the room, but they would feel like they were made by American psycho because there's this odd dislocation where, um, I mean, for me, they're they are actually the perfect appropriation paintings because they are. Um, Dionysian in act and intent when they're made maquettes and they're uh, living entities and then he actually appro appropriates that language into a painting and so they become something other and he kind of wants to negate this living thing and it's like that classic <coughs> it is like the American Psycho, it's like the highest thing you're talking about and it's just that thing of like you just want one thing to snap in the image and you just feel like John would just go I don't know. this one, and, and it's that it's that weird thing of negating himself in some way, and I'm just intrigued by what happens when you, you know, that, that you know how it functions when you have the actual maquettes next to the painting, and it sets up this kind of weird collision. You know, do you go? I like the drawings more than paintings. I like paintings more than drawings. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, one thing that, um, that Jonathan's written about, um, about the relationship between the, the drawings and the paintings, is that he doesn't see it as kind of an odd relationship. That it, that it was, um, <coughs> from his, from what he says, he says that, that it's only with, within the advent of abstract expressionism that the idea came that people would, might begin a painting without any drawing at all and just sort of begin. Um, and within the, um, so, in a sense, the continuity there, and I think that kind of continuity with other painting is something that kind of comes out, because although you're right, they, they're sort of, they're, they're exemplars of a type of appropriation, they're not using kind of, they're not associating the marks of a kind of ready-made, they're not like an appropriate, like an Ingrid Callum a, a painting, where you're kind of using something else which is, out in the world to make the painting. You're using things that you've made. So there's a sort of very, 
kind of European, it's European yeah, sort of, tradition. Sort of, yeah, kind of, um, you know. The, the components, I think, in Alaska don't seem particularly inventive. What, and so the components for me are made of, of um, a type of ready-made type of appropriation. And what's it, what becomes inventive is in the paintings is how they hang together. And then sudden, and suddenly, which is, I think, a beautiful thing, the painting's doing the work of invention. I think all, all art is about in, invention, but Lasca uses this, uh, to me, he uses this appropriation of a sort, and he uses these very familiar things. I don't think they're particularly inventive elements at all in, in the paintings. It might be invented that he had the courage to use them at all, so, so every day. And that scribble there, I saw that when I was a kid, that was Mr. Messi. I don't know if everyone knows Mr. Messi. Mr. Messi is exactly like that, that thing there. And, and I think people would be really familiar with that mark, so I think there is a type of, of appropriation there. And, and I think that the, the like, with, with quite a lot of the, the, the that they're not, they're not, kind of, they're not really expressive marks as well. I mean, that's yeah. what I'd say. The, 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 uh, um, the, the no, they're not parodies. Well, not parodies. well the, yeah. they make us ask, what is an expressive mark? So they pose the question back to us, and that's one of the sort of anxieties that we have, because we sort of assume, or have assumed since a certain moment in painting's history, that a type of mark making is about expression of self. These kind of ask us, well, the, well, they kind of put, they show us that there's a slight hamminess in the belief of that, um, and it's that kind of worry, um, which yeah, which is is one of the wonder, wonderful things that the paintings can do. I, I also I think that's because when I saw the show, there's a Paul McCarthy show around the corner, and there's a George Condo show on, and and in a way, I think when when uh, Lasker was first um, uh, most prominent, then. I think the atmosphere was kind of different in that there was a, a, a lid on, of control, whereas at the moment it seems with artists like Paul McCarthy and, and this new um, take, this re reuse of uh, George Condo, who's been out in the cold for a long time and now he's come back in and all this forgiven, we love you George, and he, he makes these out of control paintings and I think that there's a, a new sense um, in the last 10 years or so that you, you can be slightly more out of control and I think that Lasker's sits slightly uncomfortably in that, that I mean, I, I think it's a fashionable thing in a way, because I think he's a very interesting artist in terms of control. I was, I was going to ask a question about, I don't know if it's a question, but something about my only anxiety about this whole discussion, which has been interesting, and um, Sam connects to that these paintings have vaguely reminded me of Memphis furniture and the people who like Memphis furniture. And I'm still kind of on the fence about whether I like these paintings or whether I want to become a fan of them. Or, and I wonder what it means if there is a fan base of these paintings, or if there, are, if there is a moment where people get on board with them, that their kind of tension collapses because people have decided they like them. I think it's interesting to bring Memphis furniture into this discussion. I mean, these paintings, as far as I'm aware, haven't ever been shown with Memphis uh, furniture. Um, Peter Haller's paintings have been shown with Memphis furniture. He did, did a show with them in New York. And I think that um, there is a sort of uh, um, aggressive type of um, uh, s sort of sensuality yes. that that, that um, is shared, perhaps, um, with, certainly with the Halley and the um, uh, and, and the furniture. Um, but also in that article, which I referred to right at the beginning about beauty in the age of roadkill. I mean, that's sort of one of the points that he's making, that we can't trust an idea of beauty anymore. Beauty, we, you know, we don't believe it. We don't trust it. We think, you know, what's it hiding? Um, and an idea of kind of um, uh, a sensual response, um, which, you know, uh, whether, you know, is a kind of perhaps a truer response. I mean, another point that's brought up in that is if you turn the rock music up really loud, it kind of gets better. Um, and you know, we sort of, kind of, sort of do understand that um, in within its within its genre. This seems very kind of European, almost compared to the Halley, really. mm. you know, in terms of attitude to composition. I don't know. There's something very different. Peter Halley is very. Um, yeah, I mean, they. I mean, they are. But I think that. But uh, as we. You know, um, we pointed out that, that, that they were shown together. There are differences. I mean, they were shown together in a number of exhibitions in the 80s, and there were. Um, but I mean, there there is a, a different 
um, they're different artists and there's different strands running through them and um, they're yeah, very different. It kind of seems like a dialectic artist. Mm. This doesn't seem like I mean, it's, it's sort of easy with hindsight when you look back at sort of group exhibitions and how people get packaged and how you get associated with certain movements and groups. At the time, it seems natural to put a whole bunch of people together in a certain context for all sorts of reasons, and we've seen it in London over the last 30 years. But actually, as time proceeds, you actually realise that, yes, Jonathan was actually doing something rather different, and it's actually interesting to think more about those differences than those similarities now, which is, which is what held things together 20 odd years ago. Look, I mean, like any good artist, it's really hard to, um, there's no kind of benchmark. The only person I can hardly, you know, I just think like Carol Dunham, they're just kind of out there on their own, mm -hmm. you know, treading their own path. And it's, it's kind of interesting hearing uh, James mentioned this idea of value, but then I kind of instantly think it comes down to the idea of status symbol and the kind of weird uh, education that comes with uh, collectors and uh, connish, you know, connorship of uh, understanding painting. And it's um, these are about being repellent and what you can do and not do within an image. And I'm not saying that else because it deals with that, but it's just like. It's, <coughs> It's a, feel, it feels like you know you get a murky music prize. You compare kind of opera to heavy metal. It's it's very hard to you know make any kind of rational judgment about those things. Well, if there are no, there are no more questions. No, thank you all very much for coming. I can see why Abstract Critical said to me that nobody ever left early from their talks. <laughs> <laughs> because I found, I found it really intellectually stimulating and engaging and really enjoyed both of your contributions. So thank you very much, Dan and Stuart.